Welcome to Electrified. It's your host, Dylan Loomis. Quick shout out to my newest patrons, Mark E and Dick L. Thank you for choosing to support the channel. So how about this curveball for Tesla? The governor of Nevada, Joe Lombardo, just had this to say. He was talking about recentering Nevada as a pro-business, pro-development state. And in the process, he said that he would join Elon Musk and the team at Tesla on Tuesday, today, for an unveiling of plans to build a $3.5 billion manufacturing facility in Northern Nevada, that's important, we'll come back to it, for the company's all electric semi trucks. There's honestly a lot more in his plan talking about dealing with water problems and the housing shortage, so this will be linked below. But the summary of his first state of the state address is this, economic development matters. I'm proud to declare that Nevada is back open for business effective immediately. First of all, two very important things that this signifies. Tesla has very strong demand and a large order backlog for the Tesla Semi, and it also has the battery supply it needs to make use of this new big factory. There are a lot of questions out there about the cost. People saying that $3.5 billion to make 50,000 semis a year, which is what Elon said was the production goal for 2024, it's too much money. I'll explain why I think they're wrong, but most importantly, we have to keep in mind that when they talk about these announcements for projects, specifically when it comes to the state level, they typically are talking in terms of five, 10, or 15 year time horizons. Exhibit A, Elon said that Giga Texas would be a $10 billion investment over time. However, we know that the first phase of Giga Texas only cost around $1 billion to actually get the building up. And we had a similar situation with Giga Berlin. They talked about a $5.5 billion Giga factory, but that's not all up front because again, up front phase one was closer to $1 billion. These bigger amounts are again over time. Remember when I said Northern Nevada matters? Well, here's part of it. You may recall back on battery day around that time we learned this, Tesla bought 10,000 acres and the rights to a lithium deposit. At Battery Day, Drew Baglino was talking about Tesla building its own cathode plant and the lithium refinery that we now know they're starting one down in Texas. But could this new factory for the semi be more than just for the semi? Drew said, localizing our cathode supply chain and production, we can reduce the miles traveled by all of the materials that end up in the cathode by 80%, which is huge for cost. So when it comes to the semi, which will need a ton of lithium and a ton of batteries, why wouldn't they also employ the same strategy localizing the supply chain? So here's Tesla's current Gigafactory in Nevada where they've been working now for years in partnership with Panasonic. Now on this map, this highlighted area is Humboldt County, which is home to something very important. In case you're not watching, yes, this is in Northern Nevada. The Thacker Pass Lithium Mine is a proposed lithium clay mining development in Humboldt County, Nevada, which is the largest known lithium deposit in the United States and one of the largest in the world. Lithium Americas, which has rights to this mine, has been trying now for more than a decade to get production going at its Thacker Pass clay mine in Nevada. Also at Battery Day, Tesla talked about its novel acid-free saline extraction lithium production process development for sedimentary clays in Nevada. So nobody knows anything for sure right now. However, this level of Tesla semi-production is going to be very resource intensive. So personally, I think there's a really good chance. Again, this new factory is for more than just the Tesla semi-production. But here's where it gets good. So all those people saying 3.5 billion for 50,000 semis, it's way too big of an investment. Here's why I think they're wrong. First of all, let's try to be realistic here and say that this prediction by Elon is most likely a little too optimistic. We don't know how many Tesla semis they can make at the current production facility. They're probably making in the neighborhood of a handful a week, if that. So of course that can ramp up over the course of this year. They'll still iterate and continue making changes to the Tesla semi before this new factory is up and running. And then of course, how long will it take to build the new factory? One year seems to be the shortest time frame 
same, but again, 18 months to two years seems a bit more realistic. So just keep all of that in mind. We are going to use a bit more conservative number, but even this could still be too high, especially for 2024. But the point of this exercise is to talk about this facility at capacity. So 40,000 semis per year at capacity times my guess of the average Tesla semi sale price, which we still don't know for sure, would be $9 billion in revenue. From that number, if we just assume 20% margins, which would be lower than Tesla's current vehicles, which again should be pretty conservative, that's $1.8 billion in profit per year at capacity just from selling the Tesla Semi. Thus, even if this $3.5 billion investment was all up front and it was only going to be for the Tesla Semi, that's still only a two year payback period with the factory at full capacity if these assumptions are accurate. I also think it's important to note there are some calculations out there of people taking lithium per pack based on Model S packs in the past and then extrapolating that into how much lithium Tesla uses per Tesla semi pack. I think all of these are flawed and nobody really knows the accurate number. Even for the current Tesla models, people debate and use all kinds of different numbers for how much lithium is in each pack. We just really don't know for sure. There also seems to be some concerns out there about the labor shortage narrative that was going around when it came to Giga Nevada, the current one, and Tesla's relationship with Panasonic. But as far as I can tell, the real shortage was mostly for battery cell engineers, which is a very specific, specialized type of person. So I do think that narrative was somewhat overblown, not that it's totally irrelevant, but I think more of the lack of Giga Nevada hitting expectations and ramping cell output to higher numbers was because of the relationship between Tesla and Panasonic. You may remember this back in 2019. All it really boils down to was Tesla and Panasonic could not agree to new pricing for the battery cells moving forward. And then Tesla had talked about making its own battery cells. So Panasonic was wondering what its future would look like in partnership with Tesla. Now they ended up working it out and still work together, but the scale of what they were planning to do together has most likely been trimmed down. And I think the question has to be asked. We know right now Tesla Semi is using 2170 battery cells, but at some point in the future when 4680 production ramps and is scaled, will they then switch over the Tesla Semi to the 4680 cell? And would it make sense to have another production facility in Northern Nevada to go in tandem with the pilot line at Cato Road and the current line down in Austin? And before we move on, I'm sorry, but I have to say it, it's things like this that we really didn't have any idea about. Sure, maybe we thought that Tesla is going to have a dedicated semi-factory at some point, but we weren't expecting it like we were Giga Mexico or Giga Indonesia. But it's for this exact reason why, in my opinion, a stock buyback for Tesla was premature in 2022, among many other reasons as well. Point being, there's always things going on behind the scenes at Tesla in the meetings that we just have no idea about. And please do not misunderstand me, I am not anti-buyback, I just thought it was too soon. And finally, I think a big question is, will this announcement then be the next Gigafactory announcement or is this separate and not technically going to be considered a Gigafactory? Personally, I would just say there's at least a decent chance we still get another announcement in addition to this, whether it be Giga Mexico, Canada, or Indonesia. You may have seen that other bullet point in my tweet where Tesla now in Germany is offering 0.99% interest rate for leases and 1.99% interest rate on financing. Now, I couldn't find any reliable data, but I'm pretty sure that the actual rates in Germany are much lower than they are currently in the United States. However, as far as I can tell, these new rates from Tesla are going to be much better than the going rate in the market, putting further pressure on the competition. But it gets even better because Tesla on LinkedIn said that BAFA, which is just a governmental organization in Germany, has adapted the list of eligible EVs. Now the Tesla Model 3 and the Model Y will receive maximum support for all model configurations. Now, I'll be honest, in my research today, I was not able to find reliable matching data about the amount of these subsidies and exactly how it will work. I think part of the confusion and the differing reporting more than just the translation from German to English is this. From the Tesla configurator, they say the first portion of the subsidy is deducted directly from the purchase price of the vehicle by the manufacturer, 
while the other portion is reimbursed by the federal government at the request of the eligible customer if the requirements are met. So there are two separate phases to these new subsidies that now apparently all Tesla models in Germany are eligible for. It should be noted on the German configurator, it does say that those lease rates are only until March 31st, 2023. Electrek is reporting that the upper limit of these subsidies will be $7,000. So again, for both parts of the subsidy, that should be the top. So just take away that the range should be somewhere between, we'll say three and $7,000 of new subsidies for Teslas in Germany. There's finally been much more talk about Tesla's mega pack and the potential impact on the business. Hat tip to zero sum game for getting the conversation going. For those of you not on Twitter, I'm not going to walk through this math, so pause the screen if you'd like to read it on your own. I just wanted to share what I tweeted that at full capacity, talking about Tesla's Lathrop facility with 30% margins on the new mega packs that could still be conservative as crazy as that sounds, that would be $6 billion in annual profit with Lathrop at full capacity. For context, the entire Tesla business did $5.5 billion in profit in 2021. So yeah, this ramp at the Lathrop facility is a really big deal. And again, most of Wall Street has no idea what's going on. Which, by the way, respectfully to Dan Ives, I was a fan of his, but it seems like lately he's gone a bit off the deep end. He said tomorrow's earnings call for Tesla and their guidance commentary is one of the most important moments in the history of Tesla and for Elon. I agree with James Cat on this one. I think that statement is insane. Like I said on Twitter, Tesla beating or missing expectations for long-term investors means basically nothing. Just enjoy the call and getting to learn more about the company. Because remember, these expectations that Wall Street compiles are from analysts that again have for the better part of a decade not understood Tesla at all and have been trailing the story and the narrative by years. And so whether Tesla beats or misses these basically arbitrary expectations by a little bit means nothing fundamentally to the trajectory of Tesla's future. Back to the mega packs in more great news for Tesla, lithium carbonate spot prices in China have fallen 20% from the all time highs. Now again, there's some analysis on the internet about what this drop in the lithium price will mean for Tesla's margins, specifically for the mega pack. I would just caution, we have no idea really what Tesla's contracts look like in their lithium deals. It works two ways. Tesla could have locked in contracts before this price run up, so they avoided that spike again with fixed priced contracts. And on the way down, there might be a lag until we see this decrease actually show up in Tesla's margins because they need time to lock in new contracts or to have some deals at spot prices, but we don't know what the mix is between fixed deals and spot prices. So great news, but again, with the analysis, just be careful. Apparently it's let the good times roll as Tesla has increased the price of the Model Y long range by $500. Now, of course, not a big deal. It seems like Tesla is just trying to find the right level of prices in the United States given the Inflation Reduction Act. So after gauging demand after the price drops, they decided to raise it a little bit. Now, will people be scared that prices are gonna go even higher and rush to buy? Is Tesla trying to funnel people to base models to simplify production? You can analyze this in a thousand different ways, but I don't think it's worth your time. For Tesla's earnings, the company compiled consensus numbers are out. Here they are on the screen. Go ahead and pause and zoom in if you wanna see what's going on. For those interested, for the fourth quarter, they're expecting non-GAAP EPS of $1.10. And for 2023, they're expecting non-GAAP EPS of $4 and auto gross margins X credits of 23.8%. So I added Wall Street's non-GAAP estimate for 2023 of $4 right here. I also added this non-GAAP line for Tesla 2022 Q1 through Q3 which is $2.88. So if they do that $1.10 in non-GAAP in Q4, that would take us to a 2022 EPS of $3.98. What this all means is Wall Street is expecting Tesla to be flat for earnings per share in 2023. The bar is now very low, which means Tesla's ability and likelihood of jumping over the bar have become very good. Sometimes it's a good thing to have Wall Street asleep at the wheel. The Polestar 2 gets some upgrades. We have the single motor car, which used to be front wheel drive. 
Now the single motor is powering the rear, so it's rear wheel drive. The single motor gets a range bump from 270 EPA miles to 300, and the dual motor will be going from 260 to 270. No word on the updated pricing for the 2024 models. Ford is in talks to sell one of its plants in Germany to BYD, but up front, these are very preliminary talks, and apparently they're also in talks with 15 other investors or companies as well. Ford management will be going to China next week to talk about this and selling of the plant in Asar Louis, which is where they make the Ford Focus. But as we talked about earlier this week, they're set to end production in 2025. Honestly, seems like a good move for both parties. Ford was done with the Focus and the Fiesta, so might as well sell that factory and get some compensation for it. And BYD has simultaneously been looking to expand into Europe, so maybe this will give them a bit of a head start rather than building a factory from scratch. Pretty awesome move here by Aptera. They listened to the community and implemented this change. DC fast charging will now be standard with their launch edition vehicle, meaning yes, they'll be able to use Tesla supercharger network. Tesla sent an email to some customers in Virginia asking for help to support a new bill that's trying to be smacked down by, you guessed it, dealership lobbies. This bill would basically ensure that Tesla does not have to keep going through new hearings and new paperwork every time they wanna open a showroom or a service center in the area. It's a laborious process, one that Tesla has already gone through a handful of times in the state, so why should they have to keep doing it over and over? So if you wanna help Tesla, you can email the representatives using this link right here. The article will be below. The Model S and X are sold out in Europe for quarter one, which is always kind of a silly term, but what they're really saying is that the delivery dates have been pushed back to April to June. And to everybody watching the inventory tracker very closely, specifically for the Model X and S and seeing the inventories rise, Personally, I would not be sweating it. Again, this is a small part of Tesla's business. They're focused on becoming a mass market manufacturer. Not that the SNX don't matter because the margins are good, but they'll just adjust the levers as they see fit. A new sentry mode update with the latest software. Instead of the full on panic mode, it will now emit a gradual pulse of the headlights, ramping up, ramping up and down as a sort of warning. This should also help with not washing out the surroundings due to the bright flashes. Lightyear has decided to stop making the Lightyear Zero, the expensive $270,000 car, due to strategic restructuring, and now they're going to focus on a more mainstream vehicle, the Lightyear 2, that's supposed to cost under $40,000, but won't go into production until late 2025. So clearly, Lightyear was having struggles with the Lightyear Zero. So look, there's still a good chance we have a pretty volatile stock market over the next two quarters, but honestly, when you look at Tesla and their business model, it is such a fun time to be a follower of this company. And like I said on Twitter, how in the world could one be bearish? Tomorrow for earnings, my video will be later in the evening, most likely a short one just going over my main highlights from the earnings day. Find me on Twitter if you haven't already, at DylanLoomis22. I'm really starting to enjoy the platform and I do plan to finally use it more regularly. Hope you guys have a wonderful day. Please like the video if you did and a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.